Hello there everyone, UXW Bill here once again. I'd like to take this video to showcase the latest addition to my clock radio collection. This is the Sound Design model number 3428 clock radio. It's actually something from my youth, although this particular unit is not the same one that I had all those years ago. My mother actually bought this same clock radio many years ago and it finally trickled its way down to me. I had it for many years and it worked well during all of that time, though it certainly could have used a cleaning of its controls and potentiometers. And even though it had a run-in with my golden screwdriver in those times, I didn't manage to break it or mistreat it. Yet somehow, over the years, it managed to disappear. I don't know. Maybe my mother gave it away. Maybe she decided that no one was using it or no one would want it anymore and she decided to throw it out. Whatever the case may be, I have reacquired this piece of my past and as proof that that is not always a sound thing to do, I probably paid more for this unit than I should have. Probably far, far more than it's worth. I did not actually know what model number this particular set had because I never paid attention to that when I was younger and even if I had I probably wouldn't have remembered it today. But I'm happy to be reacquainted with this particular piece of my past. I was also unfamiliar with approximately how old this unit was. My guess would have been the very early 1980s, but I ended up finding a, what might be a date code sticker on the bottom of the unit. Unfortunately, the previous owner decided to wrap the power cord in tape to keep it nicely rolled up, and when I removed the tape, whatever was left of that sticker came off with it. But as you can see, this little sticker says 05-76. And while its meaning could be variable, assuming that it is in fact some sort of a date of manufacture code, I would take it to mean that this unit was manufactured in May of 1976. So right in the middle of the 1970s. And by the middle of the 1970s, although I was not around for that particular era, I think it's safe to say that a clock radio such as this was probably beginning to look rather dated at the time. Digital clock displays were coming in in a big way. But I suspect that this was a very inexpensive set when it was new, and I will tell you why in just a moment. Before I do that, let's take a look at the cabinet design. I love the understated and, in my opinion, very well carried out design and color scheme of this cabinet. The majority of the cabinet is this sort of off-white color. I suspect that it was probably much closer to white when it was new, but that as with all light-colored plastics, this one has faded to the sort of butterscotch shade that it is now. Unfortunately, this radio is not in the most excellent of condition. The plastic cabinet, especially here on the top, has suffered some indignities over the years. It's got some scratches on it, some of which are fairly deep and unfortunately it either seems to have been the victim of mistreatment or an accident as there is a chip out of the back of it. But like I said, I absolutely love this color scheme. The dark brown front panel just strikes me as a very beautiful thing. An almost timeless design if there is such a thing, despite this thing's otherwise quite vintage looks and being equipped with an analog clock. I love the way the dial is designed with the black background, the yellow delineation lines between the various frequencies on the AM and FM band, and the white printing along with the white dial and the green background behind the dial pointer. It's offset very nicely, in my opinion, by these wonderful silvered knobs. They were, again, pretty filthy, but this thing happened to clean up very nicely. Sitting next to the control panel, we have the speaker, and I would say that it would be generous to call that a 3-inch speaker, but despite the fact that it's a pretty cheap and small speaker in a cheap and small cabinet, it actually does manage to have a pretty decent sound, as we'll see shortly. The clock dial is also pretty spartan on this set. It has just monochromatic printing, black with a silver background, but sound design did choose to spice things up a little bit by applying some very nice coloring to the hands. The alarm pointer is a very festive orange, while the smooth sweeping second hand, a common feature on these AC line powered synchronous motor driven clocks, is a very festive green. And rounding out the selection of the colorful hands, we have the hour and minute hands, both of which have a blue tip on them. However, this clock does not have any kind of a backlight such as a neon tube or even an incandescent bulb in it, which seems kind of counterintuitive. 
and less than totally productive if this thing was being used in its intended capacity in a potentially darkened bedroom. Another suggestion that this was not the most expensive model back in the day is the lack of an alarm buzzer. With this particular radio, you wake up to music or you don't wake up to anything at all. The operating switch down here controls the radio and determines whether or not it is off, on, or in automatic alarm-driven operation. There's also no sleep timer on this unit. It wouldn't have been hard to include a buzzer alarm with this thing. The very common design back in the days of these analog synchronous motor driven clock movements was typically to place a loose metal arm near the field coils on the motor. When that arm was lowered by the action of the alarm mechanism turning itself on, that arm would start to buzz, driven by the 60 cycle currents passing through the motor's windings. There are some operating instructions on the bottom of this unit that explain how to set the clock as well as the alarm wake-up time. And once again, you can see that the only option offered to wake up to was music. There is an embossed notice in the bottom here that says to prevent electric shock, do not remove screws. You can see where the manufacturing date sticker once was before the tape unfortunately pulled it off. The two screws that you see actually serve to hold the power transformer in place, and indeed, it would be a very good idea not to remove them. So that's the underside of the unit. Let's go ahead and take a look at the side panel here very quickly. There's not much to say about this. The only major control on this particular side of the unit is the AM and FM band switch, which just like the volume control is a little bit scratchy and could no doubt use a good cleaning. On the back of the unit we have the typical information sound design's nameplate, the model number, a description of what this unit is, and an explanation of which particular frequencies the AM and FM tuners are capable of receiving. Below that we have the usual caution notice that says don't open this unit if you don't want to be shocked. And then rather surprisingly, especially for an inexpensive clock radio from an inexpensive brand such as Sound Design, the clock itself was made in the US and the radio was made in Hong Kong. It was very common for stuff to be made, made in Hong Kong during the 1970s and the early 1980s. Moving over a little bit, this unit explains its power requirements, AC 110 to 120 volts at 60 hertz and consuming 10 watts worth of power. It of course has underwriters laboratories and FCC certifications as well. I don't know where the cabinet for this particular radio would have been made or where the final assembly was done given that the clock movements came from the United States and the radio electronics came from Hong Kong. I was also curious as to who might have made the clock movement in an inexpensive set such as this. I was almost an anticipating to find that sound design had perhaps made it themselves or gone with one of the once very common General Time or even Robert Shaw movements. But at least one, one part of this clock radio is pretty high-end stuff, and that's the clock movement, which was actually made by Telecron. I don't know if Telecron was still a division of General Electric in the 1970s, but if you're not familiar with the name, go ahead and pause this video and look them up. I will certainly wait. Let's just say that Telecron clock movements were the business back in the day, and even though this unit is not from Telecron's golden years, it still looks to be very nicely made. And given that this unit unit is still keeping time perfectly well, seems to be quite reliable. I do not, however, plan to leave this unit plugged in and in regular use, just because these mechanical clock movements of that era seem to have some reliability problems after many years of faithful service, and finding replacement parts for them can be very difficult, if not impossible. Rounding out the controls on the back side of the unit, we have the time set knob, and we also have the alarm set. And you can see that, at least in the case of the time set knob, it was none too precisely cut at the sound design factory. They actually cut off the arrow. I don't know if that was a printing error or what that might have been. The alarm set one is also rather close, and although it's stated on the bottom of the unit that you should only turn these knobs certain ways, it doesn't seem to cause a problem to rotate them 
either clockwise or counterclockwise. So let's turn this thing around, go ahead and turn it on and have a little demonstration. Just go up and down the AM and FM dials. Probably start out with the FM side of things first. This unit is, if the manufacturing date is to be believed, about 38 years old at the time of this video's creation. And I'd say it's done very well for itself. You know, I'm not too surprised that the clock is still keeping time, but I am kind of surprised that the radio portion manages to work as well as it does. It does seem to have a few problems in addition to the previously mentioned dirty switches. It also seems that something is not quite right with the AM section. And I don't think it's just the dirty nature of the band switch because once you get below 890 kilohertz or so, it really doesn't receive much of anything. And it probably won't receive much of anything in here anyway when I do the band scan because of all those nasty compact fluorescent lights in the ceiling lamp above me. So let's go ahead and turn it on and see what we get here. This switch clicks on very nicely. Again, due to the age of this mechanism, it's probably not a bad idea to treat this somewhat carefully to avoid breaking it, causing yourself a world of hurt. I'll go ahead and turn the volume up here. And on Thursday, mostly sunny, a small chance of afternoon showers and a high 59. And you can see that it uh, has a fair amount of uh, dirt in the control, given how violently it produced that static you just heard. So we'll go ahead and start up here all the way at the top of the FM band. Just like the clock display, the receiving dial on this thing, the tuning dial, is not backlit either. So again, this thing is kind of, uh, kind of challenged if you're going to use it in a dark bedroom. But here we go with the band scan. My apologies to headphone wearers in the audience. We care about helping families. Wise Finance helped me get the cap. It's what I mean. 983-R-I-T-E-C-H. We're getting close to the piano music station, as V West Life always calls it. I'm having a little trouble tuning that in. I just can't seem to get that one. So the radio might need something like a recap after all of these years, and this volume control certainly needs a good cleaning. Again, headphone users, brace yourselves wasn't anywhere near that bad when I first tested this thing, so I don't know how it's managed to degrade so. Alright, here we are on the AM side of things. Let's see if I've actually got that switch in a position where it'll work. It seems that I do. Well, it's starting to show life on the lower end of the AM band, though I'm not hearing anything. Again, a suggestion of capacitors that are probably well past their prime in this thing. But you can tell the reception just kind of fades in once I've crossed the 800 kilohertz mark. And we're pretty much receiving fluorescent lights. Things you can hear on AM radio. <laughs> the fidelity on AM, well, it's not what I'd call hugely wideband, but it's entirely serviceable. And that's a demonstration of the radio functions. As you can see, it's definitely going to need some attention. But I will be giving this unit a more thorough going over in the not too distant future. I'll try to take some plastic polish and see if I can get the scratches, excuse me, out of the top cover. I will also see if I can clean up the clock face a little bit. It's not in bad shape, but it's definitely got some signs of light scratching and wear marks that have occurred over the years. Like I said earlier, when this thing came out of its box, and I took a look at it to make sure it wasn't grossly damaged. It was utterly filthy. But the controls on it have cleaned up very nicely, I would say completely to their former glory. And I think that something similar should be attainable with the rest of the cabinet. So there you have it, folks. 
a revisit of a clock radio from my youth that I had wanted to find for quite some time, and I finally managed to have the good fortune to lay my hands on a working and what should be able to be cleaned up very nicely example of the species. So as always, thank you for watching and feel free to leave a comment if you have one.